Hey Georgetown, it's Jay, freshman in the college, and today we're going to be attending March Forward Live's gun panel. And today I'm here with my friend Emily. Hi! That was actually in my last vlog at the uh, GU Climate Forum, right? Yeah, and now we're best friends. <laughs> Let's go. There it is. Because you know the food is always... The food makes the event. <laughs> it really does. Oh. Hey guys, we just got back from the March for Our Lives gun violence panel. And I'm here with Myra Namorlik. Um, she is the director of local affairs. And I wanted to ask you a couple questions about the event today. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what role did you play in the event? Um, so I am Director of Local Affairs in March for Our Lives. We also have a Director of Federal Affairs and then both of us are under the Political Affairs Director who's like our supervisor. Um, so I was the co-organizer of the event. Both me and the Federal Affairs Director were the organizers and then our Political Affairs Director supervised us. So um, I did a lot of emailing. Um, I emailed um, the Mayor of DC who was one of our opening speakers. Um, I sent a lot of emails with, um, the Federal Affairs Director took care of, like, Chris Murphy and other representatives. We also had David Chipman. For those who don't know, like, who Chris Murphy is, if you want to just, like, explain. He's the senator of Connecticut. And, like, his, like, role with, yeah, like, so with gun violence. Chris Murphy is the senator of Connecticut, and he really became big on the issue after the, um, Sandy Hook shooting in 2012, which obviously happened in Connecticut, very close to where he's from. Um, so after that issue, he really became big on gun reform. Um, he often holds vigils on the Senate floor in which he recites the names of children shot dead in the state. So he's very big on the issue and he wants it to be um, addressed more and often pushes Congress to pass gun violence prevention legislation. Um, so he's really cool and offered a really interesting perspective. But basically what went into the panel um, in terms of getting the speakers we just had to do a lot of emails and logistics and trying to figure out um, a time and a day that worked for all of our panelists. And then obviously we had to do a lot of stuff in terms of like booking the space. That took some time. We had to get funding for it um, because the event was catered and you do have to pay for the space. So We had falafels. Yeah, it was. Uh, we had falafel ink. Yeah. So um, <laughs> SAC paid for it, which is the Student Activities Commission. Um, and they're really cool. And if you want to like do cool stuff like that and have a cool event, they will probably pay for it. So. Okay, that's awesome, Mark. Thank you for the amazing insight of what went into the event. That was awesome. I really enjoyed it. Um, personally, I don't know too much about gun violence, so it was really interesting to hear all these um, people talk about gun violence, and it was they, there was a lot of unique perspectives on it. So um, we can both if, if we can both share like what we took away from the event, it would be really nice. I'll start. Um, so there was what was the doctor's name again? Doctor Joe Sacrin. He is a trauma surgeon at Johns Hopkins. Yeah, so he was what was really inspiring about his story is he wanted to become a trauma surgeon because he got shot in the throat when he was like 14, 17? He was 17, and 17. it was at a high school football game. Yes, so he that once he um, lived from that, he wanted to help others that um, experienced the same thing. And I thought that was really cool, but um, the most important takeaway from his talk was that um, gun violence is a public health crisis. Personally, I've never viewed it as a health crisis or a public health crisis it's I'm not I'm not too familiar with the topic so I thought it was a really new cool take on the problem but also I thought it was it was really eye-opening to hear him talk about how there's brown and black and colored people um, being um, endangered with the problem of gun violence every single day we hear about gun violence on the news every other um, it ha we, it ha we see it on the news but the fact that it happens every single day it's really interesting um, there's also this guy that was an ex-SWAT member. Um, yeah, so David Chipman was another one of our panelists, and he was a former ATF agent. ATF stands for Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. So he worked in federal law enforcement, um, and he's currently a senior policy advisor at Giffords, which is a nonprofit. Okay, so him, an uh, interesting stat he gave <laughs> me, I, I wrote it down, is every time someone is shot, there's 100 shootings, and 80% of it is not reported because uh, people do not trust in the police apparently there's like a like a, i don't know what it was like a blue yeah so basically one of his main points was um how law enforcement obviously he was a federal law officer so his experience is a little different he touched on this how his experience is different from the experience of local law enforcement and so an interesting insight that he provided is that in law enforcement there's very much a cultivation of an us versus them mentality yes yeah so exactly. it's also called like um 
it's also like that blue view. Yeah. It's like seeing yeah. yourself as blue and everyone else as not blue. Mm-hmm. Meaning, um, what a lot a lot of times what happens is in law enforcement, officers will sometimes it's, it's due to the culture, sometimes it's what they're taught, but they'll basically develop the mindset that my like when they go into um, like an area that's played by gun violence, that yeah. my safety is more important than yours. Even uh, though an officer yeah. mm-hmm. is there to serve that community and is there to protect, serve and protect, they don't see it as a, I'm willing to put my life on the line for yours because my job is to serve and protect you, but rather my life is more important than yeah. yours. And so they dehumanize the communities dehumanize, and the people that yes. they're supposed to serve. So I don't know who it was that talked about dehumanization. It might have been him. That was but him, he, yeah. Okay, he talked about how in order to shoot someone <coughs> from his experience, yeah. you had to dehumanize the other person. And well, it's easier to shoot someone. Yeah, easier to you. shoot someone. So that's what happens like, within the mindset. Because the reason why apparently like not, not as many white people are getting shot is because it's much easier to dehumanize a person of color in the yeah. environment that we live today. Um, is that what he said? Well, yeah, for certain, for certain um, white people who come from a place of privilege and who obviously, like, um, oppression and like racism is very systematized in our country mm-hmm. so if they're coming from that place it may be easier for them to dehumanize a person of color yeah okay yeah. so another stat that he talked about was um uh, when he went to a um, police conference he talked about how um, a black man is actually 11 more times more likely to be shot than wage for it than law enforcement because we so often think that the police are in danger the law enforcement in danger of being shot but in reality, the, a, a black man is actually is more dangerous. I think that was so eye opening and actually rather yeah. scary, you know. What was what's important to touch on with that is he's not saying that being a police officer or working in law enforcement is an easy job. Obviously, he worked in law enforcement, and not only did he work in local law enforcement, he worked in federal law enforcement. And he yeah. said this himself. He was very much taught that in federal law enforcement, he often works on security details. You have to protect um, like senators, important people like that. Yeah. You work with like Secret Service. Mm-hmm. You are taught that your life is 100% way less important than whoever you're protecting. You're yeah. taught bef- way before you think of ever firing a gun, you need to s- jump in front of that person and take oh, yeah. that bullet. Yeah, that it's was something a, that he said that was really eye opening. And, and so, what he, he said he he said he accepted that fact. Yeah, and, well, and that was scary. that was that was part of accepting the job. He knew what he yeah. was getting himself into. And so and how he thinks like he's always dead before yeah. when he goes so, into like, like one of the points he was making is that as an officer yeah. and a member of law enforcement it is your job to serve and protect so a lot of times officers like like i said before get that us versus them mentality where they think my life is more important than yours and therefore i'm going to take measures like maybe prematurely firing a gun to protect my life because that's way more important than you and serving and protecting you however like and then a lot of times officers will justify that by saying, well, my job is so dangerous and I yeah. need to worry about that. But actually, like you said, um, a black man is 11 times more likely to be shot. So really, in the grand scheme, who, who you're protecting, which is, in a lot of cases is a black man, yeah. their life is infinitely more dangerous or 11 times more dangerous than the job that you're doing just then. Yeah, and also the idea of like reaching out for help to the police. Um, I think the, 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 the March for Lives Leader of um, DC, what's her name again? Halissa, <laughs> Halissa Cruz, she's the state director. For okay, so ICC. she talked about something really unique about. <laughs> I might have been, I might have not heard it properly, but I think she said something on, along the lines of like, "Oh, I don't trust the police. Who else do I call now?" That's like a question like, yeah. I personally don't think about it, and I'm really privileged mm-hmm. to not think about it that way because I guess I'm not put in these type of situations. So, yeah. like, what do you, what is that like disparity between the people and police and, and law enforcement? I don't. How do you close that gap? Yeah. Um, well, I definitely think um, David Chipman touched on that as well. Um, so something that he touched on is how gun violence is very much, um, like, it's very much a class-based issue. Yeah. And oh, so yeah, if yeah, you yeah. look yeah. at, mm-hmm. you take D.C., for example, um, if you don't know, wards 6, 7, and 8 are very violent uh, areas of D.C. and they have the highest rates of gun violence in D.C. Um, And some people don't even think that they're part of D.C. because they're on the other side of the Anatolia River. Um, And what he saw as a law enforcement officer working in this area is that areas like, for example, areas like Georgetown University, like where we live, are safe. We don't really have issues of gun violence in those areas. But areas like Ward 6, 7, and 8 on the other side of the river do have very, very difficult gun violence issues and they experience gun violence every day. And an important point that he made is that 
it's clear that we can protect our communities because we yeah. can do it in on this side of the river because we can do it in areas like Georgetown University where we don't have gun violence and where we have somehow found a way to get guns out of the city to reduce crime. Yeah. We found a way to protect our citizens in those areas. So then why is it that in Ward 6, 7, and 8, they're still experiencing these issues? Mm -hmm. And it's because they don't have the money, they don't have the infrastructure in order to to stop those issues. And so yeah. like it's, it's an issue of equity, he said. So when it comes to gun reform and combating gun violence, you need to consider equity and consider the fact that some areas are safe and they're safe for a reason. Like our areas are safe because we have created an infrastructure and a system and we have the money mm -hmm. to protect ourselves. So we need to extend that infrastructure, that system and that money yeah. into areas that can protect themselves because clearly we can do it. We're just choosing where we do it. Yeah, and the disparity between, I think, I forget, I wrote it down, the difference between uh, Southeast DC and Northwest DC. Yeah, those are like the two areas. Yeah, yeah, and I think that was really interesting. Um, also, there, a general theme within all the speakers were how um, well, that we, we are the ones that get <laughs> make the difference. Yeah. I thought that was really interesting because we, uh, I personally always view it as like, okay, what's happened on the federal legislation level, but really it's really about like what we're doing and like the change that we're making mm -hmm. it was interesting to, it was really nice to see how many how passionate people were even within the audience not just the panel yeah it was a panels. full room yeah. packed house um <laughs> what's, <laughs> what's interesting about that is um so the, the title of the panel event is called only in america right so what you just talked about how a lot of times people see mass shootings and they see the violence that occurs on that like that mass level mm -hmm. And they think that the only thing that's ever going to fix that is federal legislation. We need to change yeah. the Second Amendment. We need to change our laws, mm -hmm. which obviously is true. You're not going to create lasting change without um, the infrastructure that laws provide on the federal level. Yeah. However, it's important to acknowledge that in a, only in America, well, not only in America, but it's a uniquely American issue to have a systemized and what I would argue in a way widely accepted experience of everyday gun violence yeah. and fear. Like, there are areas of D.C. and areas of many cities across the U.S. where kids go to school every day, kids walk home from school every day, and they live in constant fear of being killed by a gun. And a lot of those communities have just accepted that. Or a lot of us have just accepted that people live like that. Yeah. And that's a uniquely American experience, to have day-to-day -day gun violence. Mm -hmm. That is something that is a large issue in our country and on a certain level in our country alone. So I think that's why it's so important to recognize that change needs to happen on the local level because local gun violence is an American issue. Yeah. And that's what we need to solve. That's awesome. That's Yeah, so we basically took a, took a lot away from that event. Yeah, we did. Uh, it was really fun. Um, good good food there. Good yeah. good speakers. A lot a lot learned. Give it you have anything else to add before uh, we end this? Yeah, I have a question for you. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So, clearly you took away a lot away from the event, right? Would you say it was pretty impactful? In what sense would it be impactful? On a personal level or on? Like, did you, you took? Did you take anything away from it? Yes, uh, yes, I did take. Yeah, it. so you took a lot away from it. So, yeah. do you think it's gonna um, push you to act in a certain way? Like, are you gonna start to try and enact some change in terms of gun violence prevention? And more importantly, will you be coming to any of our meetings? Whoa! <laughs> uh, White Graven at two oh six eight to nine p.m. on Mondays, right? Yeah. See, so, yeah, I know, I know. So what we'll they see are. you there. <laughs> Um, definitely what, what I, I was basically really shocked about how, um, see my mom actually is really, I mean, obviously like many other moms in the world, they're really scared of guns, especially because all the shootings happening in the States. So my mom texts me quite often about like how many shootings are going yeah. on. And I really like don't, I overlook it. I'm like, okay, it's not going to affect me or whatever. I'm in a safe place. But when I heard about all these stats, I realized, wow, like I'm really fortunate to be where I am in the environment that I live in, but what I, how I feel and view about about gun violence, it's not what everybody is experiencing. It's so different. It's so prevalent everywhere, and that's really shocking. And definitely, that will push me to go to your meetings and make a change. Thank you. Yeah. We will welcome your attendance <laughs> and anyone else as attendance who would like to come. <laughs> Do you want to plug your uh, Instagram and the? Um. Yeah. Follow us at M F O L G U on Instagram and Twitter, and on Facebook, March for Our Life Georgetown. Yeah. So thank you so much for uh, coming to our studio. And, You're um, so welcome. <laughs> talking hopefully to we'll us Hopefully we'll see you at our meetings, and hopefully we'll see a lot of people at our next event. 
Okay, thank you so much. So, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, until the next episode, you want to do it with me? Like okay. a peace sign? Yeah, okay. yeah. Until the next video, peace!